Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to continue to look at the institutional foundations of gender, turning away from the institution of the family into the institution of work, which for obvious reasons is an important institution when it comes to uh, gender and gender inequality. Before we get into the institutional work, just to recap our last reading, we looked at the uh, Dow piece, which investigated uh, parenting practices in the intersection between gender and race. So we looked at how our culture presents people uh, racialized meanings, uh, different meanings we attach to uh, different racial categories, and also how our culture provides people meanings we attach to the sexes. So how we understand women, how we understand men, uh, how we understand girls, how we understand boys, and also how we understand different racial categories such as whites, uh, African Americans, uh, Asians. And so we can look at those meanings uh, separately, but also as an intersection when we combine the two. So when we start to understand uh, boys, as was the examination and the reading, we don't look at boys all the same. Rather, we look at them differently according to uh, one's racial category. So when looking at African American boys, there are certain uh, cultural stereotypes attached to them. And when we're exposed and re-exposed to that culture, we make the stereotypes part of our social psychology. We learn the stereotypes and they become part of our working memories, uh, how we think. And so the social psychology then in turn can influence family life. It can influence specifically how parents do their parenting when they are raising African-American boys. And so parents will use different strategies, different methods to parent African-American sons, uh, for example, compared to raising an African-American daughter. And the parents don't endorse the stereotypes of African-American boys as being more dangerous compared to other boys, uh, compared to other boys, African-American boys, and being uh, more uh, violent. So those are stereotypes that exist kind of in our culture. And just because the parents are taking that social psychology uh, into consideration of how other people may think, that doesn't mean that they think in those ways. They simply understand that although I know the stereotypes aren't true, I also recognize that other people may believe the stereotypes and may use the stereotypes to interact with to define my African American son. So in the reading we looked at a uh, few uh, four different strategies and how to parent an African-American son that you don't see in a white family when raising a son or you don't see an African-American family when raising a daughter. The parents try to manage a son's experience, uh, their environment, uh, their image, and their emotions. Going back to when we first started to talk about institutions and gender and gender inequality, we looked at how marriage and family can be broken down as institutions into three different parts. The gendered part, where we say the institution has a division of labor, roles and responsibilities that are associated with the sexes. We can say that the institution is gendering within the institution, uh, within that uh, division of labor we start to gender individuals, uh, socialize them in masculine, feminine ways. And in addition to the direct gender socialization, we also see a gendering going on indirectly when people are observing other people in roles, uh, performing those roles. So you may enter the division of labor and start to perform the masculinity or feminine, uh, femininity or perhaps you simply learn who's supposed to be doing what in terms of a gendering process 
by observing other people doing the division of labor. And finally, we can look at how institutions can be seen as uh, promoting inequality between the sexes. Uh, together, the gendered organization, the gendering process uh, contribute to a separation of the sexes. And with this separation, you often see a stratification of the sexes uh, more times than not. When you separate the sexes and you stratify them, men are getting advantaged uh, over women. Uh, women are being disadvantaged underneath men. We can break the institutional work down as a gendered institution into two main parts. Uh, the main part being how we see the segregation of the sexes embedded in the division of labor at work. So here we can start to see the division of labor being reflected in ideas of her and his labor. So by her and his labor, we say, you know, the jobs, responsibilities that we associate with uh, women and men. So just kind of stereotypically thinking about when we have a position or when we have certain duties, you know, who comes to mind? Who comes to mind in the idea of who should be performing uh, the position? Who should be doing uh, the duties? In reference to one's sex, so when we say secretary, uh, manager, and when we say the nurse, the doctor, again, stereotypically, we see the nurse being a her job, uh, the secretary being a her job, while in comparison, typically we think of doctors as a his job, uh, a manager as a his job. So when we say her and his labor, you know, we're recognizing that, you know, both sexes, you know, all people, uh, perform the jobs no matter if it has a sex type or not because we do have you know some jobs that are considered to be uh, gender neutral but even when we do gender a certain occupation we will see we will still see uh, both sexes in that position but nevertheless we still gender the position as being more for her or more for him so we see this gender, the gendered institution also being reflected in our social psychology. So there's some interesting uh, social psychological research that looks at different applications uh, for jobs and how the applications are evaluated and judged differently according to the name on the application. So we say that basically when you're looking at an application, the experience of the person, the credentials of the person will be constant, but the different variable will be the person's sex. So it will be, for example, you know, Ryan or on one application and then on an exact same application, the difference will be, will be Ryanna or and you'll see that according to the sex of the applicants, the evaluators will actually uh, do the evaluations differently. Men often are seen as getting advantages in terms of better fits, uh, kind of a better overall likelihood of giving the job uh, compared to women. And you see this holding true when it comes to gender neutral jobs and also male task work where sometimes if the task is feminized, uh, women will get the advantage over men, although there is the same background, same experience or credentials. So in addition to kind of recognizing work as a gendered institution regarding the sex segregation in the division of labor, reflected in ideas of her and his work, her and his labor, we can also see another part of this gendered institution when we look at how there's a lot of hidden labor going on within the institution and disproportionately the hidden labor is connected to the work of women and this is uh, you know very similar to what we talked about with respect to the second shift and in the institution of the family how often women are doing a lot of labor that goes 
unpaid, unseen, but still it's work that needs to be done and uh, work that's very important for the function of a family. So here we see kind of a lot of the her labor, uh, labor we, we associate uh, with women is likely to be invisible and unrecognized labor. And we say likely to be invisible, unrecognized uh, compared to the labor of men. And we can break this down, the hidden labor at work, with respect to formal and informal means. So formally, we can say that a lot of women's work is support work, background work, that although important, you know, although very significant for the overall functioning of the institution, it's not seen as important. You know, it's not recognized as being valuable work especially in comparison to the his type of work uh, that's being done. So we can talk about, again, kind of the secretary and nurse occupations that are very important for, you know, the hospital, uh, the uh, medical facility to function properly. Uh, the secretary, very important for the you know, university, uh, for the office environment uh, to function uh, efficiently but often we kind of don't even recognize, we don't even see the the workers. They're there, but in the background, you know, so we don't give them the deserved credit. We don't give them their due uh, recognition. But this can change. You know, all this is kind of based upon cultural understandings. And as we see today, what's going on, uh, the job of the nurse is going from the background uh, to the front stage area where it's being recognized and they're given the credit that they do deserve, that they should have been given all along. And so uh, we can look informally at how this also operates. So informally, we're looking at how women often have to perform different duties uh, that are outside of their formal work responsibilities. So whenever you sign up for a job, you have to kind of you know, go through your contract and on your contract, it lays out for the employee basically what you're supposed to be doing in your position, your formal work responsibilities. But often, women find themselves performing other jobs, other duties that fall outside of these uh, formal responsibilities. So, you know, we call this uh, emotional work. So often female employees are trying to calm down the office, uh, keep coworkers kind of at ease. Uh, female employees more so than male employees are sought out to help people kind of deal with personal issues, uh, personal issues that are not connected to one's work. So again, when you're talking about personal issues, non-work related issues, then we're talking about issues that are outside of your formal responsibilities as an employee. But nevertheless, often women are performing this emotional work, trying to help people out with personal non-work issues. Often women find themselves trying to do emotional labor with coworkers at work in terms of calming people down, keeping everybody on an even kill. As a gendering institution, and we can look at work with respect to you know four uh, different dimensions and again we could go you know on and on about how there's the gendering of people how there's gendered socialization going on uh, with respect to work i just wanted to pull out you know four different dimensions that we can see this going on so as a gendering institution we can see how once you enter the her or his labor once you become part of the division of labor within the institution, people are socialized in those positions and start to perform the gender accordingly. Uh, so in other words, this sticking to my examples of a secretary and a manager, if you enter the role of a manager, you have to manage your employees and the management of other people, the directing, the leading of others, is seen as a male task. We assume men are better managers, leaders, uh, compared to women. 
So when a guy enters the manager position, he's kind of socialized in terms of what he needs to do, what he doesn't need to do, and he performs the duty accordingly. But when you're doing the managing, we see that as performing masculinity because we associate management with masculinity. And the same thing can be said with the secretary. When a female enters the job of a secretary, she does a lot of the support work, a lot of the looking after of others, and thus she's performing uh, different traits we associate with femininity. So when the woman enters the job, she starts to perform the femininity. And so the femininity being performed or the masculinity being performed often is directly associated with the person, uh, her or himself. In other words, we see the person performing what we consider to be the proper gender, and we assume that's simply a part of who they are. But instead, what we're often seeing is that the person is not performing their gender, but performing the responsibilities attached to their job. So when you're a manager, you have to lead. You have to allocate different responsibilities. And no matter if you're a guy or a girl, that's what you have to do when you're managing. So often the behavior, what you see attached to the job is not a direct reflection of a person being a male or female and performing the associated gender behaviors, but rather what you see is the person performing the job. And we mistakenly think that by performing the job responsibilities, they're simply being themselves as women and as men. So a second dimension we can look at is how earlier gendering, whether it be being socialized in gendered ways uh, at school and the institution of education, or earlier gendering going on within one's family, uh, can often push people into certain jobs later on in life, or perhaps earlier on in life, and how it can pull people away uh, from other jobs. So you start to see, you know, often, you know, somebody's first job will be definitely a job that we see as uh, gendered, uh, her or his job, where more likely than not, you know, the first job of a boy that would be mowing the lawn for a neighbor, or perhaps the first job of a girl being, you know, babysitting uh, for a neighbor. Uh, so what you see here, kind of early socialization going on can start to pull and push people into different uh, future occupational aspirations, push and pull people into different uh, future uh, real occupations. So in other words, when you're teaching somebody how to you know, mow lawns, uh, basically you're kind of teaching them how to do manual labor, kind of taking care of something through a manual work where on the other hand you're socializing the girl to do more of the emotional labor uh, socializing her into kind of caring for others and then once you kind of develop these uh, traits once you start to learn these skills they can carry on into your future desires and future real occupations so you can see a connection between different institutions uh, school and family and how that ties into work as a gendering institution uh, later on. So we can look at a third dimension uh, when looking at gendering, uh, excuse me, work as a gendering institution with respect to uh, different policies regarding uh, leave. And so work policies uh, do differ when it comes to if your employer uh, if your employer will give you time off, for example, for having a kid, uh, for adopting a kid, and more often than not what you see is that the policies uh, mandate that only uh, female employees can take time off uh, for children, and male employees cannot. And so what you see going on here in terms of a gendering institution is that by pushing women into the parenting responsibilities. You're socializing them, them to be parents more so than socializing 
uh, both people, men and women, or socializing men to do the parenting. And likewise, when you're pulling men away from the parenting responsibilities, you see the socialization being imposed upon the women more so than uh, the parents and more so than uh, the men. So a final uh, connection we can make between uh, work in a gendering institution is by seeing how people identify differently according to how much their work means for them and their gender identification. So basically you see a much stronger identification with men and their paid work compared to women and their paid work because what we do as a society, as a culture, we strongly link uh, pay labor with masculinity. We strongly link uh, work and maleness. And once people are exposed to this culture, we internalize it and make it part of our social psychology. So men are very close in terms of their identity and the work that they do, where women may care about their job, but not to the same degree where if they're not working and if they perhaps lose their job or if they go into retirement, their femininity, uh, their ability to see themselves as a woman does not take a hit uh, compared to when men are not working. Uh, they're often not seen as real men through their own eyes and the eyes of others. And uh, when men lose a job, when men uh, transition into retirement, again, socially, other people see them as being kind of less than a man. And men will see themselves as kind of losing out on their masculinity when they're not performing that paid labor. We can look at four more dimensions of gender and work, but this time turn our attention to the promotion of inequality between the sexes. So the first dimension, probably the most obvious one, is when we push and pull people into the her and his labor here we start to see the emergence of inequality when it comes to pay, how much money you're going to be earning, and how much uh, status uh, society uh, provides to you in that occupation. So overall, the pattern you find is the her work carries less pay and less status in relation to uh, the his work. So just going back to the examples that I've used previously in this presentation, the secretary status is lower than the manager status. The pay of the secretary is much lower compared to the pay of the manager. And the same thing when looking at the nurse and the doctor uh, relationship. And so what you also see in terms of pay and status disparity, so the inequality that exists, when it comes to his and her jobs, when there's less sex segregation in a certain job, when there's less sex segregation in a certain occupation, what you see is there's more pay equality uh, between the sexes. In other words, when an occupation is more equally uh, comprised of women and men, then the pay tends to be more equally as well. Now, you know, it's not going to be equal, you know, with a capital E, but what we do see, there's a higher amount of equality compared to other jobs that have higher levels of sex segregation. And that kind of ties into the wage gap and the advancement when it comes to doing the same type of work. So we go back to the idea when there's women doing uh, his work, when women are in work that we consider to be work for men, or when men are in work that we consider her work, uh, men are performing work that we associate with women, you can start to see different things going on. And basically what we find is when all things are equal, when people have the same credentials, the same experience, uh, doing the same type of work, men are receiving higher pay than women. And there are you know, various kind of reasons for this going on. A couple reasons 
that we can look at would be uh, cultural expectations. What we'll talk about more with the third dimension, uh, gender beliefs about who needs money. And then we can also look at uh, social network differences, where sometimes men are involved in more formal, informal social networks at work. And this can help them advance uh, quickly and get more promotions uh, compared to women when you're in the same uh, loop, in the same uh, network as the higher ups, as your coworkers, compared to if you're out of the loop, not in the same networks. That can disadvantage you when it comes to getting promoted, uh, getting raises, although you have the same qualifications as your male coworkers. And then we can look at um, advancement. So strictly kind of looking at promotion rather than looking at uh, pay. We can say that men advance w uh, faster than women in her jobs. So here when men are performing the job of a secretary, when men are performing the job of a nurse, or perhaps the job of a, uh, an elementary school teacher, men actually advance faster in those occupations uh, compared to when women are working in men's jobs. So when women are entering men's jobs, they actually advance at slower rates uh, compared to men. So, you know, we talk about these ideas as the glass ceiling when women enter what we culturally define as men's work. They have slower rates of advancement, of slower rates of promotion, and often there's a certain ceiling that they hit that they can't move through, thus the metaphor of the glass ceiling. And, you know, I think maybe our knee-jerk reaction would say that when men enter women's work, they probably encounter the same glass ceiling. But what you actually find is the opposite. Uh, rather than advancing at slower rates compared to other employees, men and women's work advance at faster rates. And this is the metaphor of the glass escalator. So the book does a good job at kind of talking about these two concepts and why this occurs. But it goes back to you know social networks and being in the proper social networks that can lead to advancement or not. And it also ties into you know cultural expectations of you know who can do certain jobs, who can't. So sometimes the idea that men can't you know be nurturing pushes them into the administrative positions at the elementary school. So people think you'd be a better principal. Uh, rather than a third grade teacher, where women are seen to be better supporters, that doesn't push them into higher positions you know, at work. It kind of keeps them into the lower, more supporting positions, the positions that come with lower status and a lower pay. And so we can also look at how when men enter women's work, uh, typically their female employees embrace them. Now there are different intersections here. Uh, for example, Black employees are not embraced as much as white employees uh, when men are working in women's work. But nevertheless, women will embrace men more when the men are in uh, women's work compared to how men embrace women when they enter men's work. Typically, the men kind of shun them. The men keep a distance from them. And that can ultimately work to your disadvantage when it comes to advancing uh, in the job, advancing in the institution. So a fourth dimension we can look at here is how we have certain gender beliefs that can promote inequality as well. Um, often when somebody is going up for a promotion or somebody is trying to get a raise, employers hold these gender beliefs consciously, unconsciously. Uh, they believe that men are not only responsible for themselves financially, but also financially responsible for other people, whether it be their partners or whether it be uh, children. And this is in comparison to women who are often believed, again, consciously, unconsciously, to not be responsible for supporting others financially, but sometimes are thought to be actually supported uh, by other people. So a partner takes care of the woman, so she doesn't need the raise, she doesn't need the promotion as much compared to the man. Or perhaps the woman's family 
a parent or parents are taking care of her financially. So she doesn't carry as much of a burden uh, compared to the male employee. So again, when you have these different gender beliefs, uh, again, sometimes consciously, unconsciously, they can become part of the decision-making process when it comes to who is given the raise, who is given the promotion. Men are advantaged compared to women. So finally, we can look at a uh, fourth dimension of inequality when it comes to work. Often men are pushed into more dangerous forms of labor and the harmful, relatively speaking, occupations could be, you know, being a police officer, um, going into a certain type of manual labor that comes with a lot of physical risk. But, you know, also a lot of male jobs come with uh, mental health uh, issues as well. Again, a police officer is an example of that, where it's a very male-type position, but a position that comes with uh, higher levels of mental health consequences, higher levels of physical consequences uh, compared to uh, female task jobs. And then we can look at how women are pushed into jobs that, again, relatively speaking, are more replaceable occupations compared to uh, his jobs. And by replaceable, we're not necessarily talking about somebody being able to simply replace you. But we can also say replaceable in the sense that a full-time job can be more easily transformed into a part-time job. So you kind of see this going on at universities, at different places of employment where you used to have a full-time administrative assistant, a full-time secretary, but as a cost savings uh, mechanism, you make that job a part-time job. So we cut down the hours and you pay the person less, provide them less benefits uh, compared to a full-time job. So it's easier to do with you know, a secretary position or a nurse position uh, compared to doing that to a doctor or perhaps of a manager or professor. And then those jobs are, again, in comparison, easier to consolidate. So I know at Millersville, for example, we have secretaries that not only do secretarial work, administrative work for one department, but they also do it for a second department. So again, you kind of consolidate the job for one person rather than having two people do the work. It saves you on uh, money, it saves you on benefits. Looking at how we can apply intersections to gender and work. One major pattern we see is not only is there disparity, inequality between the sexes, we can also see this being uh, compounded by the intersection of race with gender. So the pattern basically is, yes, you know, women all are uh, worse off compared to men, but certain women are worse off compared to other women. And what you start to find is often racial minorities are going to be more disadvantaged uh, compared to uh, white women. And the same uh, pattern unfolds when you start to look at men. So white men are advantaged over non-white men when it comes to work, pay, status, and then also we can say that certain advantages men have over women lessen uh, certain advantages decrease when you start to look at racial minorities. So the advantage a white male may have over a female may not be the same type of advantage a racial minority male has over a female. Another intersection we can look at is how sexuality intersects with uh, gender. And so specifically, you know, non-heterosexuals, but also we can look at uh, different types of gender identification, uh, trans workers, how non-heterosexual, uh, how non-heterosexuals and trans workers uh, today, they do experience uh, fewer barriers, uh, barriers when it comes to actually getting a job, barriers when it comes to uh, 
coworkers being homophobic or perhaps closed-minded about gender identity. So yes, there's progress when you're experiencing fewer barriers, but at work today, we do see how the non-heteronormative status of these individuals can lead to having less protection at work. So certain protective work measures that allows men and women not to be discriminated against are not sometimes part of the institution that protects the homosexual or that protects the trans individual. So that's kind of the other side of the coin. Yes, progress is made. Uh, trans workers, non-heterosexuals encounter less barriers, but they don't receive the same protective measures as the heteronormative individual does. Specifically looking at trans workers, we also see that they're gendered by their fellow workers. So trans men are basically treated as men, you know, through the ideas of masculinity. Uh, trans women are seen kind of treated as women and femininity. So to me, it's just interesting how you gender the trans individual the same way you would gender the non-trans individual. In addition to that, uh, studies have started to show that trans men receive more advantages at work, encounter less barriers at work uh, compared to trans women. And this is a pattern that we've already talked about, how women and now trans women are kind of up against it, experience more disadvantages at work compared to men and trans men. So we'll leave that there uh, for today, and we'll continue to look at uh, different institutions when we come together in our next class presentation. Although we're not going to be doing a formal reading in our book, I will be turning attention to the institutions of education and the institutions of sport and how the two institutions tie into uh, gender and gender inequality.